we can start. So we are still doing optical flows, which is gonna help us model time, or at least it changes in time from one frame to the next frame. And we are doing also depth estimation, which is about inferring the 3D structure of the scene from one or a couple of images. And so far, uh, when it came to depth estimation, we covered two papers and they were assuming that you know the corresponding ground truth, which is turning the problem into a supervised learning problem. Uh, can you actually move beyond supervised learning towards unsupervised and self-supervised? And the next three papers that I'm going to cover, they're going to belong to that category. And actually, the last one is really interesting because it's going to help us uh, combine optical flows, semantic segmentation, and depth estimation together to come up with an improved algorithm. So let's start with the first paper of today. It's about molecular depth estimation, where you are trying to be consistent and satisfy some left-right consistency. And it's gonna become clear how things are gonna work. The task is you have an image at test time, there is only one image, and you want to infer the corresponding depth from that single image at test time. So some of the objects are closer, for instance, this car is closer to us, the other cars are further away, and we want to infer that from only one image at test time. So a single image is gonna go in, you're gonna have a neural network, which is convolutional, it's gonna give you the predicted depth. And now the question is, how are you gonna train that? You need to learn G, that function. Uh, the problem is uh, you either have to work with simulated data when it comes to depth estimation to give you perfect depth, or you can use some laser scanners, but the laser scanners are not gonna give you perfect data. They're gonna end up being noisy, and they're gonna end up being imprecise, especially when there are a lot of movements in your scene. Like there are some cars that are moving around. And that's why we need to go beyond using supervised learning and go towards unsupervised and self-supervised. What can you do? You can treat depth estimation as an image reconstruction problem. During testing, you want to work with only a single image, but during training, maybe you can start working with stereotype of images or binocular type of images. So you can start working with two images. And intuitively speaking, the idea is that if you have a pair of binocular cameras, they're looking at your scene from two different perspectives. And if you can learn a function that is gonna help you transform one image to the other image, then you learn something about the 3D shape of the scene in front of you. So that's the idea. During training, you're allowed to work with two images. During testing, you have only one image to work with. Your training data is gonna be Kitty. You're gonna have a left image and a right image. One of them is coming out of uh, a left camera. Another one is gonna come out of the right camera. So it's gonna help you, before I go into any details, intuitively speaking, I want you guys to take your thumb look at it, and then uh, close your left and right eye while looking at your thumb. It's gonna give you two images, and then there's gonna be some disparity between these two images. So keep closing your left and right eye while looking at an object, which could be your thumb, and then you're gonna have an intuitive feeling of what we are trying to do here. So there are two cameras looking at a particular point. We know that you have a focal, for your cameras, you have you place them B, uh, perhaps meters apart or centimeters apart. So F is your camera focal length. B is the baseline distance between the two cameras. Z is the depth, how far that object is. And then D is gonna be the disparity. These are the number of pixels that you need to shift the right image to the uh, left to match the left image that you're seeing. So now you're shifting your pixels around. If you take a right image, shift it according to the disparity, it should be close to the left image that you're seeing and vice versa. And you need to be consistent. You can look at this triangle here, this bigger triangle. You can look at this other triangle and use the similar triangle rules. And you can come up with this, this equality that if you take your disparity divided by B, 
it's going to be equal to the focal length divided by the depth. So what did we just do? If you reformulate or rearrange the furniture a little bit, you are going to be able to recover depth by knowing the intrinsic properties of your cameras and how you place them, BNF, in terms of your disparity. So if you know your disparity, you're going to be able to know your depth. So the problem now becomes estimating the disparity. Because if you know disparity, and if you know the properties of the cameras that you're using to record the images, then you're going to be able to compute the depth. So this one I'm going to leave as an exercise. I just told you what these uh, triangles are. This is the bigger triangle. This is the smaller triangle. And then you're going to use the similar triangle rule to come up with this formula. Okay? So there is a direct relationship between disparity and depth. So let's go ahead and try to learn disparity. You're going to design a neural network that's going to take an image as an input. So it's going to take only one image because that's what you want your algorithm to be doing in production. So it's going to take the left image or the image seen by the left camera. It's going to push it through your architecture, your neural network, and then it's going to output two disparities, the left disparity and the right disparity. The left disparity, you can use it to warp the right image towards the left image. So you can use the left disparity to sample your right image to make it closer to your left image. And that's going to give you I left, I tilde left. And what do you want? You want these two to be equal or be as close as possible to each other. Take the right, right image, warp it according to the disparity of the left image. It should give you the left image. Similarly, if you take the disparity of the right image, use it to warp the left image, it should give you the right image back or something close to the right image. Now you're going to be able to write down your loss function. Once you write down your loss function, you train your neural network, you're just going to take an image, push it through your architecture, get both DR and DL. You can get rid of DR in production or while testing and just report DL. And from that disparity, you can compute the depth. So now it's a question of writing down your loss function and training this. Your loss function is going to have uh, a couple of components. First of all, you are going to look at your images at different scales, at different resolution. The other one is you're going to have different components and you're going to weight them accordingly. And let's see what they are. First of all, you want the appearances to match. What do I mean? You want your left image that is being produced out of the disparity to actually match the left image that you already have, similarly for the right image. So this term in your loss is about the left image. You want the produced left image to match the actual target image according to a norm. This is L2 norm. At the same time, we know that L2 norm is not going to convey the perceptual similarity between images. Maybe something like a scene is better. It's going to give you the structural, structural similarity. And to write to see the exact formulas for a structural similarity, you can take a look at this Wikipedia page. So it's going to take you to the exact formula that you need. Or you could put a perceptual metric here, maybe something like a VGG neural network. We cover the perceptual or a couple of papers on using neural networks as perceptual distances. And there seems to be a good correlation between the distances coming out of pre-trained neural networks and what a human is going to think about the scene. We cover the paper on that. This is for the left image. The right image is exactly the same. So you're just going to change these L's to R's. So we cover these two terms in your loss, which was about matching the appearances. You want the disparities that are coming out of your neural networks to be smooth. So this is just a regularization term. And you're penalizing the first derivatives in the x direction and the right direction. But you don't want to penalize. You don't want things to be smooth around the edges. So you're going to remove the penalty with an exponential function. Whenever this is an edge, don't penalize. So these are edge-aware weights. And while you're doing your training, you know where your edges are. Actually, whenever the gradient of your image is high, there is going to be an edge there, whether it be x direction or the y direction. So this is just a regularization term. This was for the left image. You can have it for the right image. 
So just change L to R, and then you're gonna get these two terms. The other one, which is about the left-right consistency, which is the main point of this paper, is this loss, the disparity that you see from the left camera, you can adjust it, or the disparity that you see from the right camera, you can adjust it to match the left one by just shifting the pixel locations. And this is coming out of this relationship. And remember, this x1 and x2 that you see, they are about the pixel locations. So you can just shift your pixel locations left and right, and then try to match the disparities. And this is only happening in the j direction of your pixels. So this should be i comma j, i comma j plus d l i j. So you're just shifting the j coordinate, and this is where your image is being rectified matters because you don't want things to be changing in the both i and j directions. That's why first you're gonna rectify your images so that these lines are parallel. So you're warping your images a little bit so that these two lines are give you a single plane. You don't have two planes. And then you only need to shift a j location of the right disparity according to the left disparity, and then you're gonna be able to match the left one. And as I mentioned, when it comes to test time, these are all for training. Once the training is done, when it comes to testing, you're gonna use DL and you're gonna discard DR. Just get rid of it, you don't need it. In terms of some of the applications for depth, uh, there are some, these have applications in augmented and uh, augmented reality or virtual reality. For augmented reality, you are putting some objects where the real world is and you want them to be put in the correct location. You can have synthetic depth of field in computational photography. There is another application for robotics when you want to grasp something. You can use depth as another set of features when you are doing human body pose estimation and when you do human computer interaction. For robot assisted surgery and then converting 2D films into 3D films in an automatic way, and the other one is self-driving cars. So it has plenty of applications, knowing your depth or having a sense of the 3D geometry. Any questions about this one? Was everything clear? So the cool thing is that unlike the previous paper, here you're only working with your images. You don't need to know the ground truth depth estimation to supervise your algorithm. So it is self-supervising itself, but you need some additional data. For instance, you need to know what is the focal length of your camera, how far you're placing your cameras next to each other. And you need to have two images or pairs of images when you're training. But once you're testing, you only need one image. Okay, in that case, we can move on.